Yeah, let's go ahead and start. It's um, 7.02, so we can start the webinar. Um, so first, I'd like to start by welcoming all the um, members of Bitcoin Trend and Forecast and any of the members that John has invited from his two sites, the Ace of Coins and um, Privacy Fight Club, um, to this uh, presentation of protecting your current and future assets um, with host Marius Landman and guest speaker John Singleton. Um, before we get started, I'd like to familiarize our audience um, with both John and Marius. Some of you may be familiar with John, some of you may be familiar with Marius, and some of you may be familiar with both, but I thought we would um, start by going through a little bit of John's background. Um, John is an entrepreneur and investor and has been since the age of 12. Um, while in college, John researched the debt industry and discovered that small businesses and consumers were being exploited by the legal profession. John learned that no attorneys or accountants were addressing the most important issues with business or consumer debt, and that is risk and liability. Over the last 26 years, John has developed various strategies to eliminate many types of risk and debt liabilities for people in small businesses, creating things like reorganization and asset allocation plans. Many of these strategies include showing people how to search for return on capital, offset strategies, and net present value rather than tax breaks and interest rates. John runs two websites, the Ace of Coins and Privacy Fight Club, where he assists members to manage their business, create new cash flow, invest in assets, and personal income with no tax obligations and much better risk management. The core of John's strategies has focused on using the correct property rights to avoid tax liabilities, certain regulatory and reporting requirements, and risks associated with being sued while at the same time managing these property rights with complete anonymity in most cases, and we love that. <laughs> so next, a um, little bit of background on Marius, the host um, for this evening's webinar. Marius has over 20 plus years quality health, safety, and environmental algorithm and statistical data experience in oil and gas operations combined with plant and mechanical engineering safety, linear infrastructure, mining, military, construction, financial, and medical facilities. He has comprehensive and authoritative knowledge as an international certified lead auditor and broadly regarded as an algorithm data expert while demonstrating an outstanding level of business acumen. He has developed and implemented a broad range of occupational health, safety, and environmental data management systems to recognize national and international standards. Marius has exceptional management and negotiation skills, married with a detailed knowledge of legislation and regulatory agencies, possess processes and policies. He is well-networked, intuitive and tenacious, and his hardworking attributes are supplemented by strong and empathetic team building, mentorship, and coaching skills. He has a proven ability to build vital and trusting relationships with a broad range of stakeholders. Marius has been active in the cryptocurrency industry since June of 2016 and currently runs the industry's largest cryptocurrency website, Bitcoin Trend and Forecast, which has a global reach with members in Africa, Europe, North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. So there we have a little bit of background about both our host for this evening and our special presenter. Um, before we begin um, the evening, I'd like to thank John um, for um, joining us on Sunday evening and for Marius for joining us early on Monday morning in Brisbane. Um, as a matter of procedure, what we'd like to do is um, allow John to present his material, um, at the end of which um, John will take calls as well as will Marius. We just ask that you raise your hand and get into the queue and then um, we will um, take the questions as they come in. Um, you may have a question for John, but during the course of John's presentation, he possibly could answer that for you. If he does, if you could just take yourself out of the queue, that would be great, and so that the next person in line um, can get their question answered. And with that, 
I am now going to turn it over to Marius to see if he's got anything he'd like to say, and then we'll start with John. Bill, fantastic. Uh, that's really great. Bill, as I promised uh, to people that are going to be on this call just before we hand over to John uh, Singleton, is that we will give you a little bit of extra information. A lot of members here are not yet subscribers, but I'm going to give you a hint what's going to happen with Bitcoin. Now, I say our subscribers get this data days before the market moves. We literally know in many cases, probably 80% of the time when the market is going to move. So on the screen, you can see that uh, we came to this top here at about 7374, around about there, depending on the exchange that you use. We said then that when the market heads up into that point there, that it is going to pull back to about 7,200 in that range. And then right here, this bottom here, that's a very good time to buy. We were looking for this indicator to tell us what the market is going to do. The next step here now is that this market is going to go upwards and you literally within the next few days are going to see a breakup. We expected the market down here to actually break down further. And we mentioned to our subscribers that said that if we break through this level here, there's a possibility that we can go down to 3,800. But nonetheless, Bitcoin broke up there. That's a really good indicator. It's a change of the pattern for Bitcoin, which makes it really, really good. What we basically do is we would send reports out similar to this. This is the report 191. And uh, unfortunately, I just had to redact some information, but uh, all our members here that are subscribers have got all this data. We basically say that Bitcoin continues to hold the upwards trend direction uh, with no drop uh, below 6.5. And from data reviewed, we expect a strong move upwards. Guys, this Monday, Wednesday, somewhere in this region, into our initial target of 7899. So this is what you can expect, and this is some free information that we are giving you. Short term, this is what we said uh, here on the 17th. We said that short term, over the next 48 hours, which is gone now basically, but we said that the break upwards into 72400, then into 73, and then into 74, which it did happen. And then with a moderate spike jump or a strong move upwards, and then from there it's expected to pull back to about 7.2, which it also did. And then we said that uh, that is where we buy back into the market. That is our indicator that Bitcoin is going to jump, literally jump and have a vertical spike into the price range of 7.899. Now, uh, the pullback is the level where we could enter and re-enter markets again. And... Uh, then obviously it's going to go to seven, eight, nine, nine into that range. You know, we can be off with a few dollars, but the point is, you know, the direction is up. Data shows it's a move upwards. And um, yeah, for the rest of the data are uh, actually just for long-term members, but I've given you a hint that Bitcoin will go up to seven, eight, nine, nine. When Bitcoin goes up and jumps up, cryptocurrencies will make enormous gains. You could literally see some cryptocurrencies that make a 40 or a 50% gain. You already see that Digibyte, for example, jumped 60% from the low where we said it will come down to a low point and then head strong upwards. That's a 60% gain. So, Bill, yeah, that's just a little bit about uh, the data here. I just wanted to give somebody, you know, all the people that took the effort and came on this call today, just a little bit of extra information. This data can just make you some money. Over to you, Bill. And so, then um, we, yeah. Well, thank you, Marius. And what I was going to also say is for those people who are not members, this is the kind of information that Marius shares on a weekly basis with those, um, with those members who are part of his Bitcoin trend and forecast group. So we get this on a regular basis every Thursday, as well as um, updates um, on a consistent basis. So thank you for sharing that, Mario. No worries. So John, welcome to Bitcoin trend and forecast. And thank you, Bill. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for joining us this evening. I know you've got a lot of information um, that you're going to share with the group tonight. I think probably one of the most important questions that, um, that, that, I, that I wanted answered from you, and I know you've done a great job with helping set me up, it is how do, how do we avoid paying these like so-called taxes that the IRS says we have to pay on our capital gains when we trade a cryptocurrency and actually show a profit. Well, there's the key there is you're going to have to pay tax on capital gains, but no one says you have to have a capital gain to use the money. 
So you want to structure your property right so you don't incur a capital gain. Okay. If you go so, to an accountant, they'll just show you how to incur a capital gain. So you really have to understand how to manage your property rights. So what vehicles do we need or what vehicles can you offer to our members to help them structure those property rights? There's a standard um, structure I like to use, but it's not necessary. Um, it can be done in many different ways, but the standard way to do it is use a partnership or a limited liability company. Those are the easiest because you can interact with the banking system, the traditional banking system. A lot of us have this issue because we're right now we're still in fiat and we're going into cryptos and we're going back and forth. Um, so if you're using a company of that kind, you can register it in your local jurisdiction or a foreign jurisdiction and you can interact with the banking system and they'll let you do that. If you just form um, anything other than a trust, if you formed a limited liability company or partnership and don't register, deal with the banking system. So that's our kind of our limitation there. But where you don't have any privacy when you're signing for the company, what we're doing is setting up, and you can see in your documents where your property rights are not disclosed to the bank, even though you're a signer. And the bank can see that you're not the property owner, property meaning cryptos or gold or real estate, it doesn't really matter, stock, you can do this for anything, any anywhere there's property rights. So it's the company structure that the state recognizes, the government recognizes, that's the easiest thing to work with. So those would be the LLCs then that you're talking Most about? Most commonly, a limited Most liability commonly. company. Yeah. Okay. If, if you don't have that recognized in your jurisdiction, you can use, you can actually use a joint stock company, which is every mm -hmm. country has that. You can also use a limited partnership. Those are a little mm -hmm. more complicated, um, but really the tax benefits, let's just talk about taxes. And you're gonna find mm -hmm. out later that your biggest risk is not taxes. You'll see, you'll, you'll find out later that taxes are the last thing you need to talk about. Um, but yeah, you can, you can uh, eliminate that kind of risk with just the way you do your accounting, the way you use the structure, the way you use the account. Like here's a quick example where I might have a $100,000 gain on something, before I take that gain, before I realize it, before I put it in my ability to spend it, I can borrow it out of the fund and use it to buy an, another asset. And the loan itself is not taxable. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of ways to structure that. I can use the loan in my own name or I can structure the loan in a company name. Um, I, don't, I can use a third party or myself, but just as, that's a quick example of if I ch just change the way I'm using the money, the property, then I can change my liabilities. Okay. So let's say, for instance, I've made $10,000 in Bitcoin and I don't, and I move that, that profit into a, say, stable coin. Now, I've done this within my limited liability company that I've set up with the account that I've set up with the, um, with the bank and with the, um, the exchange that I'm buying and selling my cryptos on, correct? So I need to set this limited liability up at the exchange and trade within that LLC. That is the easiest way. Um, I can show people how to do it without setting up an account at the exchange, but that's not really recommended in the beginning when you're just learning. But yeah, mm -hmm. use an LLC at the exchange that keeps everything very simple. And you can even be kind of sloppy with how you keep track of things because that account holder, the LLC or partnership at the exchange may get a 1099 or may get a notice that it has a gain, okay? But it's not gonna be a gain to you. It's gonna be a gain to the company. And mm -hmm. that can be arranged to where there is no tax liability, even though it has a tax number and even though it gets a report and that a copy of that report gets sent to the tax collector. It's still not going to be a taxable gain if you use your accounting properly. Okay. So as law, okay. So if I, let's say, then realize a $10,000 gain in cryptocurrencies and I take it out in cash, I realize that gain and I take that gain out in cash. For that particular transaction, where it's just a straight transaction, I cashed out, I cooked my $10,000, I am liable for the $10,000 in taxes. But if I don't take the $10,000 out 
and I just continue to trade within cryptos, I'm not liability for any. I'm not liable for any taxes. Is that, that is correct? one example. That is okay. one example. Um, but people say, well, that's boring. So what? I, I can figure that out. Ten thousand dollars. Yeah, I just keep it out of dollars. Well, that's not useful. So the question is, how do I benefit from the ten thousand dollars? I want to go mm -hmm. on vacation, or I want to buy right. a boat, or something, right? So you would you can move the money. Here's one example, and there's like ten ways to do this. You can move your sell your coins. Well, I don't care what you're selling. You take your ten thousand dollars out. The company sells it. Okay. The account holder is the company, the LLC, for example. And now there's ten thousand dollars in the account, and you want to use it for something like buy a car. You can simply go buy the car. Let's say it's a used car for $10,000. You would very easily just title the car in a company name. So what that amounts to is your LLC bought or funded another mm -hmm. company. And it mm -hmm. doesn't matter what that company does. It just so happens that the company bought a car. I'm not saying that's the way you should do it, but it's pretty easy to move money or profit or gain from, let's call it a tax deferred owner, an LLC, right. to another business entity. And again, it didn't come to you. Yeah, you're using the car, but it's actually not your car. It's owned by the company. And even though you have 100% interest, still uh, you're fine because all it did was fund another company. Likewise, you could go into another investment as well. Right. So that was my next question. So let's say I'm just, I found somebody that wants to sell me, that, that, that will sell me a property and they'll accept Bitcoin. And I've realized a windfall profit on my Bitcoin. So now I've got enough Bitcoin that I can buy a property. Can you explain how um, we go from one hard asset to another hard asset with and avoid those tax implications? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, you can go right from your coin. So let's say you made all your money in Bitcoin cash and everybody understands how to use Bitcoin. Like your regular transactions are probably mm -hmm. gonna be done in Bitcoin. So you take the gain that you had in Bitcoin cash and you move it to Bitcoin, you isolate the amount of money you wanna spend. So you have whatever that is in a Bitcoin wallet and you deliver that wallet, however it's going to be. It's gonna be cold storage, it's gonna be a paper wallet, I don't care. Just the address, whatever. You can deliver that to an escrow agent, just like you normally would. Let's say you're gonna buy some real estate. The escrow agent would source the dollars. Now you said that the seller here in this case likes Bitcoin, so that makes it mm -hmm. easier. You don't, this, that, that way the escrow agent, you still wanna use escrow, but the escrow agent doesn't need to source dollars now unless he needs to pay some other closing costs, right? Mm -hmm. So then he, he only needs a little bit of dollars. The rest of the money would just go from your Bitcoin wallet to the sellers or however he wants to do it, whatever security he wants. So from Bitcoin to escrow to the next asset, title the asset in the appropriate way or encumber it with a, a lien or a loan of some type. Mm -hmm. And again, you can avoid any tax situation. In fact, you can avoid a situation where you're in the middle of a lawsuit and let's say someone already has a judgment against you and he's actively trying to collect against you personally, you can do this entire transaction and completely legally avoid attachment of, from that creditor to what you're doing. So you can move a million dollars into another investment and everybody can see what you did and the creditor can't attach that million dollars. So, I guess this really, uh, so we're really kind of talking about property rights here then. To Absolutely. Extent. And there's, there's all kinds of understanding when it comes to property rights, because you have a lot of things going on. Crypto, you asked me, and I appreciate your questions here. You asked, what is crypto? Let's talk about that. Cryptographic currency or crypto, cryptographic tokens or assets of any kind, that is property. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and by the way, privacy itself is a property right. It's recognized around the world that way. That's an interesting, you'll see how this works later. Um, but when it comes to cryptography, the use of cryptography is also a property right and coins, crypto coins, those are also property, which have property rights. Mm -hmm. So how does then the IRS, what gives the IRS the ability then to say they, that we would owe them anything if they're, if they're asking for, if they're taxing our fiat currency, if we never move to fiat, let's just say in a perfect world, we never moved to fiat currency. We always stayed in cryptocurrencies and only traded back and forth those 
those capital, you know, those capital gains, that's a, that's, those are property rights. That's a, that's real property. It is. Um, You can do that in your name. It's just that when you take property in your name, like real estate, for example, or you sell the coins for dollars, uh, dollars are taxable. What we're talking about here is the taxable thing is dollars. It's not cryptos. There is no tax Mm -hmm. on cryptos. That's why, you know, I talk to accounts all over the world. And, you know, people say, can you talk to my account, please? And we, we do a Skype call or something. And I say, okay, so you're, you understand about the crypto asset. And they say, yeah, I understand. I go, so what laws have changed in your country regarding the tax on cryptos? And there's, they can't answer me because there are no laws. They don't have to make new laws because cryptos are defined as property. So we have a hundred years of case law and tax law on property. So you have to manage the property in a way that doesn't, incur a gain. So mm-hmm. the one example I gave you with the escrow, that's one way. So mm-hmm. yeah, you could do all your transactions. Like you could go, you could, you could have a personal account at an exchange deal in Bitcoin. And then you could take your Bitcoin and pay a seller of real estate in Bitcoin. So you go from Bitcoin to Bitcoin, and then you acquire real estate and you mm-hmm. take the title. Now, if you put that title in your name, their taxing authority is going to say that is a gain because mm-hmm. you just obtained the exclusive right to sell the property and you didn't have it before. And now we got to talk about cost basis and all these things, but you don't have to own the property that way. I can put the property in the name of, let's say another LLC or another company and then and live in the property. You can do it that way. And what you've done is you funded another company Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that's not a trick. I mean, everybody does right. it. Our congressmen, the people that write these tax laws, they live that way. So how do you think they become super rich and they're actually not super rich on paper? They're poor, but they're actually super rich because they have buying power. It's just not in their name. So this is just a simple version of how to do something like that. So, John, w- would it be fair to say then that the legislative powers that be have written certain loopholes into these regulations so that they have an avenue to realize their gains without paying any taxes. Okay, I wouldn't call it a loophole. What, what I would just say is that the profession of accounting, and this is why I got started this years ago, that's why I got into it, because the profession of accounting steers people towards tax liabilities. There's just no other way to say it. And it's not like your accountant's evil. They just think they know exactly what to do and they think they know everything. Uh, And then you go for advice and who else are you going to talk to? You're not going to call some guy in Florida. You know, you're not going to pick up the phone, call that guy. You're going to call a CPA or a tax attorney and you're going to ask them the right questions. And that's the responsible thing to do. You should do that. But he's not going to tell you that you do not have to retain the exclusive rights over property. And he's not going to tell you that you can defer a, a gain to avoid a tax or even other types of liability. He's not going to talk about that. Most of them will not talk about that. Okay. It's institutional. It's not like there's some loophole. Okay. It's just the way it's the way things are, so to speak. And it's not changed. I mean, I don't care what, when someone, I get people all the time asking me, Hey, there's this new law. And I, I read it out of just morbid curiosity and it doesn't change what I'm doing. I don't care what the statutes are because I have a right. I have a property right. I have the right to, you know, organize my property rights however I want. But yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll try to create an interest or a taxable or compelling interest to tax something around what they can tax. But ultimately, if you structure your property rights a certain way, um, it doesn't matter what laws are written because they're always going to have their own path to avoid the tax liability. And that's what they're doing. They are doing the same thing. Mm hmm. So do you just kind of hypothetically, do you see the laws changing anytime in the near future? I think there, it looks like there's a trend toward trying to eliminate (laughs) the, let's say that your legislator is looking at how people are using stable coins. They want to, they want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. I really don't think Mm -hmm. that's likely, but Mm -hmm. I, I do see things like, um, uh, disparaging the dark web. Okay. There's nothing right. illegal about the dark web. Just like there's nothing illegal about a gun. Um, unless I use it to hurt somebody. Right. Uh, same thing with cryptography. I see, uh, an attempt to 
prohibit cryptography in some way or scare people from using it or make it, you know, demonize it. Um, but it's just like the time in prohibition in the States uh, that didn't last too long. It wasn't very effective because people will still have their liquor and people will still need and have their privacy. So I really don't see any act of legislation that's going to inhibit our ability to use this technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've pretty much been talking about um, the U the U S and how things are set up in the U S but I know on the call tonight um, we've got members and guests from uh, around the world um, from Australia to New Zealand, to the UK, to, to Africa. And I know you've worked with some clients outside of the U S um, what would you say to those individuals who are not U S citizens with regard to um, these, the process and, and what you can do for U.S. citizens? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it, like I said, it doesn't matter what country you're in because you still have property rights. So what you want to do is divest your exclusive rights over the property. This sounds really weird. Like, what does that mean? Divest your exclusive rights. That is, don't be the only one that has the right to spend money or sell property. And the way you do that is through you need a banking facility. So it's kind of twofold. We're kind of stuck in a system, a banking system right now that is going to require us, not a law, but the bank is going to require us to register a company structure. So you want a company structure that you can pass through profits, pass through gains, pass through income to its owners. And then those owners can be any myriad ways that suits your needs. So here, here's a quick example. I'll give you a couple examples. If I did something let's say in the UK or Canada, I could use a partnership, in which case I would, now I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but I would use a foreign partner as the general partner and the limited partner would be the local resident of Canada or the UK. And then I would make the property rights of the partner and the general partner in a way where there's an undivided interest in the ownership. So that way, there's no accounting that's needed. There's no tax liability because there's two individuals that would normally be subject to taxes, but because their interests are undivided, they together would not have a unique tax liability because they're strangers. They've never mm -hmm. filed a tax return together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you, once you have an undivided interest, you can then proceed to do the things that I've been talking about. You can borrow money out. You can, you can, uh, there's, you know, you can, I'm not going to go into too many complicated things, but basically you can spend the money in a way that doesn't uh, create a gain for any one of the owners that would normally have a tax liability. So again, it, it kind of boils down to the interpretation of property rights laws. Right. If my, if my property rights are X and I tell everybody what that is, well, the government's going to say, okay, if your property rights are X and you said that and you filed a report and told us that you owe us this percent and they have a right to do that because that's what I did. It mm -hmm. all comes down to what I do. But if my, if my property rights are somewhere X, Y, and I haven't decided what X is yet. And my, my X, Y, my other partner hasn't done anything. Said, so to yeah. He done hasn't, anything. Uh, yeah. We haven't divided the interest. We haven't done our accounting because of the way we're running the business or the investment fund or whatever that is. No one could tell me to go make a calculation. No one could tell me how to write a contract. I mean, if I have a contract to kill somebody, of course, that's illegal. But if I have a contract on how I decide to manage risk and disperse funds and invest in something, nobody can tell me uh, how to do that unless it involves other people's money, like I'm selling securities or something. There are laws on that. But when it comes to private property, I can pretty much do whatever I want. Um, let me give an example. I looked at a, um, and I talked to an accountant in, in Canada. It was kind of revealing because he was, he was a retired accountant. You know, it's funny. The retired professionals will tell you all kinds of stuff, but while they're in the profession, they won't. So anyways, he's, he's you know, we're going over this uh, partnership agreement. I said, show me a, a standard partnership agreement that you would use in Canada. So he sends me this document. And I read through it and we're looking at this thing and it, 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 set, it sets up capital accounts and it sets up accounting periods and it sets up disbursement schedules. Okay, these are key phrases in a standard contract. And this is what I'm telling you. If you go to an accountant or a tax attorney, I don't care what country you're in, you're going to get something like that. And they just, they have this in their computer and it's just a form and they think they did their job and they probably did what you asked them to, but they didn't plan to manage risk properly, I think anyways, or prudently. So mm -hmm. what I asked him, I said, well, what if I change 
the property rights so that um, we don't have a capital account for each member, each partner. We have an undivided interest and a single capital account. And he goes, oh, I never thought of that. I said, yeah, what law requires me to have a capital account for everybody? So right, right, right away, that's, you know, that ends that issue. And then what about a disbursement schedule? We haven't decided to who's going to get a paycheck when, right? So mm -hmm. we whittled it down to where we have a partnership, we can run a partnership. And then when it comes to dispersing funds, we can decide at some point in the future what that's going to be. But we don't have to do that today where it would create some sort of liability, even to a creditor. Because if a creditor were to go and try and attach my interest, if my interest is expressed in the partnership contract, right. that interest can be attached unless it's an LLC, which is a, this is a way to rely on statutes, but LLCs rely on statutes, which sometimes that's beneficial, but generally a partnership, your interest can be attached without there being a disbursement. So that's another reason to have the properly written partnership contract. Okay, interesting. So you, so for say for the members that are outside of the U.S., there are avenues which they can utilize mm -hmm. to secure the similar benefits that we can here in the United States using things like LLCs and, and partnerships and the other vehicles that um, that that you are that you make available. You can do it in every country. You can do it with the existing laws in that country, with the existing business structure. Another example would be if I have a Canadian, to make it easy, I can, I can open an account at, in another, an exchange somewhere in another country with a legal structure that's created in the States, which I've done. So I set up something in the States, the Canadian signs for it at the other exchange in some other country. And then everything, you know, there's still, Bank Secrecy Act rules and things like this, and we meet all the KYC, know your customer rules. Um, all the structures we do are uh, set up for that. And uh, that's just another example. So if I have a difficult time dealing with, okay, here's, here's the idea. A Canadian has certain tax obligations. To avoid those legally, I can set up a structure to where uh, his interests are not expressed while he's managing the investment. And at some mm -hmm. point he may have a tax liability, but today he doesn't. And, and for the most part, I think I don't, I haven't run into a situation yet where there is a tax liability, but for the most part, the person can actually disperse funds how he needs to, he can reallocate into other investments. Let's say he makes a lot of money in the crypto world. He could then reallocate to let's say real estate in his home country without a tax liability from that transaction, from the principal. I don't know mm -hmm. about after he owns the real estate, but, in the meantime, no, there won't be a tax liability. Okay. John, what other things do we need to know? What else, what else is going on in, in, the, in the crypto world that we could benefit from? Well, um, people opening accounts at exchanges, just realize that you can have the right to enter into a contract however you want, as long as the contract, of course, is not patently illegal, right? Mm -hmm. So people ask me, well, am I allowed to open an account at Kraken with an LLC? Well, you're able to contract with anybody in any way he or she agrees with you, right? So Kraken can just say, no, we don't like companies. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense because Kraken is a company. And why wouldn't a business want to do business with another business? Because that might mean more money, more profit. So I don't see a limitation in the future. Now, sometimes, uh, organizations will do things like, for example, I've seen some MLM programs where they'll say, if you want a company in your downline, if you want to be a company in, as your position instead of individual, uh, we'll only let husband and wife be the owner of the company. And therefore you have, you have no uh, corporate tax benefits. I don't know why somebody would do that. I've seen that before, but just realize that you have the right to organize your risk however you want. And no one can tell you otherwise. And, um, I know they make it difficult for you at the exchanges sometimes. Yeah, they, they do. Product. I can yeah. I can tell you from personal experience with Kraken trying to get an LLC open, I've had to walk away from it because it's been so um, onerous that and I have I can't even I've given them more documentation than I I, I yeah. Anyway, I've yeah. stepped away from it just to take a break because after one full week of trying to work with them and resolve the issues, um, they you were know, not making, they were not, they, uh, it was obvious they did not want my business. 
Uh, yeah, and there's no issues. It's just that you're just no. dealing with idiots sometimes. And like, I'll give an example. I had someone setting up an LLC account here in the States and it was out of her state. So she had to do it over the phone and their internet. Now that's common, but this is a few months ago, six months ago. And she called Bank of America, which I told her not to, to do. I said, just do it over the internet. But she called Bank of America and the person asked her like 70 questions. And normally what I have people do is just say, look, just open the account. And the backstory is that it's for real estate. Because they ask you all these questions like, what are you going to do with the money? Where are you getting the money from? So you don't want to say, I'm not telling you, they're just not going to open your account. So you give them a justifiable backstory. And she did a great job. She answered all the questions uh, really well. And the person was just being a jerk and said, we can't open your account today. So she was really patient. And she called me back and she says, yeah, I mean, she told me the story. And I said, well, tell you what, why don't you, and I know you've, you're really exhausted by now. I said, why don't you wait until tomorrow and call back? chances are you're going to get a different person and the account will get open because everybody gets his account open. You just got to be persistent. Well, she called the next day and sure enough, got somebody else in five minutes. She said the account was opened. So there's that going on too. Had another woman. um, She, so one of the things I do on the ownership is I make the owner in many cases, an unincorporated association. That means I don't have to create a whole new entity. I just identify that there is an unincorporated association that owns the, the company. So that way you don't own it, but you control it. And that way, under the Bank Secrecy Act, the bank can't ask anything about the unincorporated association. They're not allowed to. So the bank kept asking about the association, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. They're not supposed to. Here's another example. They don't know. They're not trained well. Yeah. So all I did, it took me a little bit of you know, work here, but I did this for one person. Now I could do it for everybody. But basically I sent in, I had her print off a two page memorandum that I wrote up and it just explained what the bank's obligations were under the bank secrecy act. And I sent that to her the next day. I got an email from her. She got, she said to me, okay, thanks. That worked <laughs> after this whole, yeah, it was like a whole week of back and forth. And I said, you know, let me just write up a memo here. And, and she did and poof. And then like um, KuCoin, for example, KU Coin, mm-hmm. they were they were asking some silly question about the date I had written on the articles was three weeks different than the date it was actually registered. So the, the one of my members said, "Well, the KuCoin is asking me why," <laughs> and so I said, "Well, tell them this," and I gave him a one-line quote. I said, "Tell them the date on the articles is this date, and the date that the state actually registered is this date." I just restated what was obvious. I didn't even mm-hmm. go into anything. And I said, just give them that. And sure enough, poof, the account got opened. So you, you kind of have to understand what you're doing and that understand that you have property rights and that people are not your boss. Like people are telling me they're afraid of their account. Not, they don't say they're afraid of them. They just act like they're afraid of them. They say, well, my accountant allowed me to do that. <laughs> and I say, well, look, if you have a problem with your accountant and you know, he's working for you and you have all the liability. He has zero liability. If he doesn't want to do what you ask him to, then get somebody else. So realize that you're the boss. You have all the mm-hmm. property rights because you have all the liability. That's why you have all the rights. Mm-hmm. That's right. Correct. You have to act Correct. like it. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Well, John, thank you. That's been great. And I think we've pretty much covered off on, um, the questions that I had for you. Um, let me see if Marius has got anything. Marius, is there anything that you'd like um, for John to go over or any questions that you have for him? Well, no, not really. I think John explained it very clear. And it's, uh, I just want to reiterate, you know, it's really important what John, John has said. And I urge people to go and rewatch this video again because you jam packed a lot of information there, John. And it's very important, guys, that you protect your assets, protect your crypto assets. Who knows what legislation is going to come out and what these governments are going to go and do. Number one, they are after your money, period. Because if they can keep you poor, they can control you. Think about this. And this is why you need to understand why cryptos are where cryptos are. At one point, it's going to break out and they won't be able to do it again by suppressing the price in cryptocurrencies. It's going to explode in price. And when it explodes in price, you don't then in a year from now want to come and run to John and say, please help me now and sort, sort things out. You need to do it now before that happens, because it may be too late at that point. You know, the best action is take it now. It's like we've been telling people buy silver now while you can get it under $20. 
do not be surprised if silver jumps to three digits overnight at any time. And then suddenly you're going to have to pay $100. It's the same. You know, we've brought John on here. John, thank you for your time. We really appreciate that. And Bill, I've got nothing really to add. John has said it all. We may just open for questions for the next 10 or 20 minutes. Bill, over to you. Yep, I think we've got a couple of um, some hands here. So I think C, uh, C, can you, can you hear, unmute yourself and ask John your question? There you go. You can go ahead. C has actually been there for a long time. Shall we go to New Creation Church? Yeah, let's go to the next question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't mean to uh, I have this account set up for another use. So anyways, I'll change it right now. Um, I wanted to know, has any of these tra tax strategies been challenged by the IRS in court? And you you know, I guess I'm, I'm still concerned about liability as far as, um, you know, if this strategy would, cha would be challenged in court and if you have been successful in, in, um, in uh, defending, like, let's say the Bitcoin, uh, the cryptocurrency trust. Does that make sense? You're muted, John. We can't hear you. Thank John. you. I can't unmute oh, myself. Go. That's all. Oh, I'm go. not able to I'm unmute sorry. myself. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, I've been doing this for 26 years. Um, my first cases, uh, just half dozen cases back in the early 90s, uh, involved the IRS only. And what I picked up at that point was that I could reorganize the client's assets during an audit or during an IRS levy where they were just taking everything or during a bankruptcy. I could reorganize his property rights, which I didn't understand at that time. I just figured I would do some quick changes and then try to work it out, which sort of started working. But basically, I have reorganized people's property and assets and income right in front of the IRS during the ugliest situations and succeeded at fixing the problem to where the IRS debt, whether or not it went away, it actually was not attachable to the client's property going forward. So I've never been challenged in court and most of my strategies, I want to avoid the need for litigation. So if I'm writing a contract, for example, I wanna write it in a way, or if I'm creating an obligation on a property right, I wanna make it to where I never need to go to court to defend that. And so far it's always worked out that way. I don't know if that helps you there. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is um, if you, if we have been declaring this as uh, personal income and then we switch to this, like, you know, over the last two years, cryptocurrency market's been brutal and I've got some, some large losses that have accumulated over it that I can, you know, write off on my personal income tax. If we create this entity, will those losses still stay with my personal that I can continue to use that? Or how does that work if you use a, a cryptocurrency trust and you roll your money into that? You know, is there a problem with doing that? You can't you mix it. Thing? Yeah, I do. I've had this question many times. You can account, if I set up something for you, if you use some of these ideas, if you understand what I'm talking about and you set that up, you can account for them the way you just described to get a tax break or tax benefit, but you're going to have to continue to do that forever with that company structure. Once you do it, it has to stay that way. So what I tell people is forget tax deductions. Don't look at tax deductions as something to shoot for when you can actually go look at gain and return on capital. That's more important, forget tax deductions. And I've always made a lot more money that way. Instead of shopping for interest rates and tax deductions, I shop for return on capital. I don't really care what the tax consequences are. It's like, that's very easy to manage that. So that's just a, I don't know, it's gonna have to be like a mindset you'd have to deal with. Like, do I wanna, we call it stepping over the dollars to get to the pennies, okay? And, and by the way, it's not really tax strategies. I don't care about taxes. It's property rights strategies. It's risk management strategies. Mm -hmm. And you'll find out that, like, if we, if we had more conversations, you'll eventually find out that 
uh, your biggest risk is actually not having an asset allocation plan. It's, it shouldn't be focused on, and I, I know I'm, I'm going to say this and you guys are not going to do it right now. You still want to know about the taxes. But if you don't have an asset allocation plan, you don't know what to do with $10 million or $100 million that you just made in an asset over here, cryptos or whatever. You've never had that kind of money before. And you, a lot of you guys are already experienced this and you will about, you're about to again. If you don't have a way to you know, invest it somewhere else, uh, I'll give an example. I always ask clients that call me and they say, hey, I've got 80,000 in credit card debt. Can you help me? And I say, sure, I'll try. What, uh, what would you do if I gave you a million dollars right now? What would be the first thing you'd do? And they say, oh my gosh, I'll just pay off my mortgage and my, uh, my credit card bills. And I say, well, that's the first problem. That's, how, that's why you're calling me in the first place because you don't know how to use capital. And they say, well, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why shouldn't I pay off the debt? And I say, well, you should, but why should you pay it off? Why not take your whatever amount of money that you would normally pay the debt off with and go buy an asset or even a portion of that portion of that money and go buy an asset, right? And then use that cash flow from the asset to pay off the debt. That's, a, that's how you properly manage new capital. The other thing that people don't understand is, let's say I never had more than a million dollars in my life and all of a sudden today I've got $10 million and my partner and I wanna go and buy a hotel. So we do that and we pay cash for it, which is not recommended, but they pay cash for it because it's easy, easier, and they just sit on it. Now they've got a, an asset, it's probably a pretty good asset, but they've tied up all their capital into one asset, which is not recommended. And they're also acting as their own lender because having a loan is a way to manage risk. And that's, that's what people have to understand is that you can have a nice windfall, but you have to learn other things about managing that risk. And part of managing that risk is taking on a lender. It's not mm -hmm. just because you could pay cash for something doesn't mean you have no risk. <laughs> so there or, are a lot of other things besides taxes. Or just because you can pay cash for something doesn't mean you should. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. That's a perfect way to say it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've had plenty of deals where I could pay, you know, uh, I could pay for it. Right. But I won't, I will always ask the seller. I will always ask my partner. I will always ask a third party. I always ask. You know, and sometimes I have to match funds. That's okay. And even if I did pay cash for something, I'll still go look for a lender. Okay. Thanks for that, John. Um, we've got Adrian up next. Adrian, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask John your question, please. Thanks, Bill. Hey, John, this is Adrian. I uh, just had a quick question. Um, so thanks for all the information. You might be available. Um, actually, I had a chance to uh, go through your website and read everything, but um, I might stop to uh, hopefully set up a call soon. But my question is, um, does this only pertain to um, crypto or can you uh, really make this work for any type of gain, whether it's, you know, Forex, you know, um, you know and, and, as, and as far as, you know, I know you said this is, this, this is really coming down to cryptos being um, classified as property, right? So uh, in my thinking, would it be, could you do like a 1035 exchange like you would be able to in real estate? Like if you were to take some of your crypto gains from another investment, would that, could, could that work since it's considered property or? Okay, a 1035 exchange is a, an exemption. It's under a statute, section 1035, right? So why do I need that, which requires me to file a tax return and do accounting, which defeats the whole purpose, right, of, of structuring the property in a way where I don't have the tax liability to start with. So I can do a 1035 type exchange with anything outside of even those rules. I don't need the 1035 exchange rules. I can, I can sell a hotel and buy an apartment complex, right? That wouldn't be allowed in a 1035, but I could do that if I'm using a tax deferred structure. I can do that in any country uh, just because of the way I'm managing the property rights. So I, I, I wouldn't even care about the 10, I've never used a 1035. I've never had our, any of our members use a 1035. Why would they? I'll give an example. Yeah, and to answer your question, I started in the early 90s, mid 90s, and uh, most of the people that I was working with are, were dealing with um, business income. Uh, yeah, business income, employment income, that sort of thing. And then it was uh, assets like stock. And you can do it with anything. You can, you can use these strategies with anything like stock, real estate, cryptos. Cryptos are just the latest thing. You can, you can do it with commodities, whatever you want. So it doesn't really matter the asset class? Not at all. We're still okay. dealing with property rights. Okay. Okay. Yep. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next up is Stuart. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask John your question, please. Thank you so much. Stuart in the United States. Um, two quick questions. The first one is, what if we've been in crypto markets for years under our own personal KYC? Is there a process to transition into this limited liability? And then the second question, probably more near the end, is what are the next steps? How do we get started to become more official and incorporated or whatever we need to do? Thank you. Well, I okay, appreciate the questions. I'd like to discuss those with you individually because everyone's different, even though I pretty much have a general solution, but for most people, I like to talk about it. Um, so we can talk about that. Um, you can you can use a personal account and you can fund your crypto investments however you want. So you can have a, an account in your name where you've disclosed everything, your SSN, your tax number, and then you're buying it all and everybody can see it. They can see how much money the cryptos has, have, has made before you sell it. And when you go to take profits, and I'm not talking about you have any type of business structure, that's just a personal account. When you go to take profits, let's say you made a bunch of money and now you want to buy a you know, a, an apartment complex, who knows what that is. Like I said, you can, you can go from Bitcoin. Remember, this is your personal account. You can go from Bitcoin to escrow, have the escrow get dollars and then pay the seller. And then you have a choice. You can take the title to the apartment complex in your name. If you leave it that way, that will just create a tax liability on the principal, right? So you, you avoid the benefit of tax planning, okay? But if you take the title in a company name, all you've done is fund another investment. It would be just like um, investing in Bitcoin cash, making a lot of money, and then investing in some stock without ever taking a gain. You just sold your Bitcoin cash for stock mm -hmm. or you sold your Bitcoin cash for real estate. You can do it that way as long as when you go to acquire the next property, it's either not titled in your name or you put a loan on it. So there's two ways without even using an LLC account at an exchange to realize, realize a gain without actually having a tax consequence. I'm not saying you should do it that way, but you can do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Did that answer your question? Okay, I guess we did. Rob, you're up next. Go ahead and unmute yourself and... Um, Ask your question, please, sir. Rob? Okay. There you go. Thank there you. we go. Hello, everyone. Um, so I didn't quite hear the answer, but I think people are dancing around it. So I'm a pretty simple and basic uh, lifestyle right now. So I have a lot of uh, crypto investments that hopefully we realize some gains. And um, John, I've been, uh, I think on, this is my fourth webinar, um, been following you and ready to, ready to jump in and just keep doing some research. But so if I, under, so funding LLCs is my question and using wallets and like, so I, I want to share with my family. Mm -hmm. um, and if I understand, it right I can have some family members uh, be employees of my companies and benefit from the properties the cars the different companies own is that and then I can have those family slash employees beyond bank accounts that are attached to those as well correct is that am I under yeah, standing sounds, correctly well that sounds really complicated when you talk about employee <laughs> okay. you bring in a whole world of yeah. <laughs> taxation and regulation <laughs> as soon as you say employee or as soon as you say investor or something um i don't recommend that there are many ways to bring family members in um when i set up a structure i actually make your family the owner it sounds weird but um that is actually the unincorporated association so to that extent it doesn't matter who's signing for the organization you can do whatever you want without making people employees and getting permission and filing rep reports and whoever you just do whatever you want. You can literally print out a paper wallet on a value of coins and hand it to the person you want. Now, if you want to use the system, you can, you know, you can use the, the gifting system and all that stuff, the tax exemptions, you can do all that too. 
You can also use something called a, um, a grantor retained annuity trust. Now that's completely in the system. I don't think that that's necessary, but you know, for some people, if you know, if you want to use a statutory creature, it's it is it is actually an S corporation. You have to file tax returns on it, but you get a hundred percent tax benefit. It's kind of cool. So uh, th there's that, but you can also just use a cold storage wallet. You can literally you can move money any way you want. You can move coin from one wallet to another wallet. Like for my neighbors, my friends, you know, they come over and I, I show them how to open these wallets and stuff. And then I give them, you know, a hundred bucks or something, just move it over and then they can start uh, dealing with it. I don't do anything with that hundred dollars. They're, they're not reporting it or anything because all I just did was it'd be like handing them a gold coin. That's not taxable. There's no sale. Okay. If you want to give somebody some property, there's not a sale there. Now, if you report it as a sale, it will be taxed. Uh, that's the difference. It comes down to how you report it. I guess, uh, let me give you an example also. Um, gentleman in California a couple of years ago wanted to sell his house. He had a closing date. I think it was like $600,000, I think. And, and he was going to get a nice fat check out of it. So he wanted to avoid the capital gains. So what we did is transfer the property before the sale. Now he had already had a contract on the house for the sale of it. So what we did is a quit claim deed for estate planning purposes. Now, normally when you do a quit claim deed on some real estate from your own personal name to a company name without further uh, designation, it's considered a sale because it's a third party. But what we did is we got a form from the state of California in that county and it's a checkbox form and it asks you on the form was this is this conveyance done for estate planning purposes and then we checked that box and that excluded the documentary stamp tax which i think he would have paid like twenty thousand dollars instead he paid like twenty five dollars for the filing fee and he transferred the title okay when the property sold the funds cleared in his llc company bank account and he was able to take 100% of that principal and go invest in whatever else he wanted to do. I did that for um, a stock, uh, private stock as well. Uh, this guy had over a million dollars in stock and his partner was buying him out and he wanted to keep 100% of the principal. So we did the same thing. We, we tr in fact, when I looked at the corporate charter to see what rights he had out of like a page and a half of all these conditions he had to meet to sell the stock, the last line of that section said, if this transfer of stock is done for estate planning purposes, then all the foregoing doesn't apply. <laughs> so all I did was write a stock transfer agreement. He, he gave it to his attorney that was doing the closing. And then his company then sold all the stock. He got all the money over a million dollars. And then he went off and did, I think he went into cryptos actually with that. So um, it comes down to how you account for it. And the key phrase, and I'm gonna say this again, if you guys wanna do some research, the, the thing, the key phrase is you can, you can fund other companies from one asset to another. Just don't take the gain. You can also transfer value that's priced in dollars. You can transfer from over here to over there. You can transfer your titled interest in real estate to an LLC's titled interest in real estate. If you own the whole company or part of it, you can transfer your interest. And if you do it for estate planning purposes, estate planning purposes, it's not taxable. So there's a lot of times where I, I have to do it that way. That makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, John. Alex, you're up next. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, John, I have a question. Um, so for myself, I figured it out after three weeks uh, with my lawyers and friends, but um, uh, that was a couple of years ago already. Um, do you actually have clients that were able to open um, LLC accounts uh, with Kraken so that you get uh, your business account on Kraken with your LLC? And um, do you offer that kind of service uh, also for Binance as I have uh, some clients of myself that are interested to get a, a, account, a business account on Binance, but uh, my lawyers that normally do that for me, they are too tied up, they're too busy to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would rather sure. than go with you. Yes, I, I can help you with that. I always offer that. Um, the difficulty just comes in communications. So as you're being asked for information, let me know and I can, I can show you how to word it. I mean, I can't do it in your behalf. It, it'd be nice if you have an attorney to do it in your behalf. A lot of times they mess it up though. So you kind of have to know what you're doing anyways. But yeah, I can uh, help you communicate with the exchange to get the account opened. Uh, also with Kraken. 
Kraken in a any exchange. It doesn't okay. matter. Okay, yeah, be because uh, Kraken is really difficult. So when I tried it by myself, uh, after two weeks, I kept you. Uh, I just yeah. stopped and uh, was giving it to 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 my to my lawyer and friends, and um, which is also a crypto lawyer, a well-known crypto lawyer, and said, "Please deal with it. I, I cannot do it anymore." Yeah, you know they ask you stupid questions like, "Can you give us your organizational chart?" <laughs> no, they they they, so, they, yeah. they, were, they were they were stupid questions asking about like how is my KYC policy with my own exchange company that I had uh, on local bitcoins because I had a, um, a cash bitcoin exchange running in Paris. So and um, and then also my AML uh, procedure. So I, and I gave them all the information and they were like, yeah, but what is your policy? And I was like. What policy, you know? And I was like, okay. hey, come deal with it. Okay, just quickly, just so everyone can hear, what, what I recommend in that case is you simply adopt their policy. Yeah. And because, are you dealing with other people's money? Uh, not right now. Okay, so what you tell them is, uh, this is not a tr an institutional or trading account that where I'm using other people's money. So I'm not required to have a KYC policy or an AML policy. But the documents I give people when they, work with me is I do have an AML certificate in the documentation. So that should actually satisfy their request, which is ridiculous. But I put it in there because the idiot on the other side goes, oh, AML, yeah, check. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we could do it that way. Or we can even go like, here's an example. Let's say if I'm going to open a set, a, set up a merchant account, the merchant processor will ask if I have a terms of service and privacy policy in this garbage, right? Yeah. Back way back in like 2004 and such, I used to do this. I would just go to any other website and just do a copy of somebody else's privacy policy. Now you can just generate your own for free on the internet. But I used to copy just a standard privacy policy in terms of service and give it to the merchant processor and they'd open my account. So we could do stuff like that too. But yeah, if I know their specific question, I can show you what to do. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Um, JT, go ahead. Hi, John. Thank you, Bill. Um, John, I was wondering if you could clear up, um, I don't know if it's a misconception, or I'm actually in California with the LLCs, because I, I always hear that there's distinct advantages to opening up an LLC in Nevada or Delaware. Um, considering I'm in California, I mean, is that still an option just because of the tax advantages that, that I know are, you know, are, are familiar with those types of LLCs that are out of Nevada and Delaware? I mean, have you come across somebody that's actually done that or are there issues with that? Who's, who's telling you about the that there are tax advantages in Delaware? Um, well, for me, not so much out of Delaware, but it's just, it's more out of Nevada. So an LLC out of Nevada um, to avoid, well, not necessarily to avoid California state tax, even though it's through the roof, as you know, like crazy. Um, but I guess that's that's one main purpose, I guess. You avoid state okay. tax. Okay. Well, none of the none of the uh, structures I've set up in 26 years ever have incurred a tax liability, unless like one out of a thousand might that I set up only because they had employees, like it was a brick and mortar business. If you're doing what you're we're doing here with cryptos and whatnot, there's no reason why you should incur a state tax liability or federal tax. Um, and I do avoid states like California, not for taxes. I just avoid California because simply um, the state is too nosy. The state gets involved in everything that it can and does crazy things to people, as you know, probably. I avoid Delaware because it's not for this type of structure. Delaware is probably really good for mid-level businesses that are offshore, ironically. They come to the U.S. for whatever reason. I think, in my opinion, that's what I think Delaware is good for. I don't use Delaware. I avoid California, Illinois, for because their state regulatory agencies are just a nuisance. It, you can get around them, but it's a nuisance. Um, also, Texas, same idea. Uh, Delaware, I avoid. Nevada, I avoid. Because Nevada, on its annual reports, if you want to keep your company in good standing, they just nickel and dime you. And it just takes up a lot of time to file reports every year. It's ridiculous. So the best states, in my opinion, would be Wyoming, New Mexico, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, Colorado. Colorado is really good, too. Um, uh, yeah, so Ohio is really good. Pennsylvania is really good. Pennsylvania does not have annual fees or reports due. Uh, New Mexico doesn't either. So 
those are the recommended ones. And if you're in California, I will never, I think it's irresponsible for me to recommend a California company to anybody. And you even have to go to the point where when I set up a company for somebody in California, it's going to be in another state. And we work that out. Sometimes it's in Wyoming or New Mexico. Sometimes it's in Ohio. It just depends on what your needs are. Um, and I actually have to do it in a certain way. So the state doesn't tell the state of California, the franchise tax board, that there's a resident in California registering a company in another state. Because if that is discovered, your state will send you a bill for not registering in California. So I actually avoid that situation. I also avoid annual registered agent fees. So that way, when I give you a structure, it's pretty much debt free, reg regulation free, clean and clear. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, and even a flow through the way I do this, um, if there is even a state tax liability, it has the same situation as the feds. There won't be a tax liability because of the way we're using it because of your accounting practices. Cool. Thanks, John. Okay. Next up, Jared. Hello. Uh, can you hear? It, it, a little bit of an echo. In? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, he's muted. Uh, while Jared is just uh, trying to get on there, Bill, uh, can we just tell our members where they can get hold of John? All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Jared, can you give us one sec? John, would you like to go ahead and give everybody on the call this evening your contact information, your website? Um, sure. Sure, appreciate that. Yeah, um, aceofcoins.com is a good uh, site, and also privacyfightclub.com. You'll see different. We have a membership site at privacyfightclub.com, and aceofcoins.com has uh, many uh, articles on this subject. So there's two good websites there. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good, Jared. Uh, we're just going to unmute you and then uh, just ask you a question if you're okay there. Oh yeah, just a quick question. I just wanted to know um, at what point is this uh, like worth doing for the small guy? Like um, five figure investments. Like, is it is it worth pursuing? Uh, you know, for the the little guys that are that are in this. Okay. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could just you're talking five figures and you're investing, and um, you can use your personal account. When you go to take profits, I mean, let's say you're, I don't know, what, what do you expect profits? Like $500,000 maybe? At that point, why would you pay, you know, 30% tax on that when you could just defer it into an LLC and, you know, it's, and, and just wait until you take the profit. You don't have to have it set up right now. I mean, that goes for everybody. You don't have to do it today. If you want to change your property rights, you want to take advantage of this, uh, do it when you're going to actually have the gains when you're gonna realize the gains, when you're gonna spend the money, right? You can, I mean, a lot of people like to do it early, but you don't really have to do it that way. Okay, cool. Great. Nate, go ahead. Okay, see you in the morning. Nate? Night, uh, we can't hear you. Would you mind just to speak inside your mic? Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me now? A little bit better. Yes. Perfect. Um, just, a, just a quick question. If we're not based in the U.S. Um, and we weren't working with you, or let's just say that you have had too much clients, um, have you got a checklist for what we can ask um, maybe account uh, tax professionals in the U.K. or in Australia or in other countries uh, to just make sure that they were on the same uh, path that I mean that you're recommending to us, please. Yes, I do have a checklist and it has specific questions you'll want to ask your tax person. I can send that to you. You can just ask me by email. Um, I've written it up in several articles, but I'll go get the best example and send it to you. Okay, that's great. great. I think let's go to Lynn. You guys, thank you so much. So I have a question. Um, you were talking, uh, John, about an LLC, right? So what about, is this referring to single owner LLCs or LLCs with at least two or more partners or members of that? Um, because it seems like you see partnerships, obviously partnerships consist of one or, or two or more. And also, does this, 
does your strategy apply to S corps, particularly California S corps? I want Can't. to exclude California S corps. They're of no benefit. It's no benefit for this strategy for anything. I don't no. know why anybody would do it unless he's running a gas station. Then yeah, maybe I would do that. Um, but uh, yeah, um, you could you could use an L. You're asking for an LLC or. I mean, because yeah, well, I'm trying to see a member, if, dual member, right? Single member, dual member, because right now I have a single member, single owner S corp that owns shares in other companies, but I was trying to get it to do your strategy so I can avoid okay. the tax liability. What you do is if, if the S corp, it's an S corp because you filed a return, right? That's why it's an yeah, S corp. Yeah, sub chapter S, correct. But it's actually okay. a C corporation through the state. Okay. All right. So notice how, that determination was made by what you filed. Correct. You can file, yeah, so that's interesting to note that. It's what you do that c creates the tax liability. What I would suggest is this. In order to create a pass-through, meaning there's no obligation for it to file a tax return, once it files, it has to keep on filing. So, right. so what you wanna do is, instead, of, you can have a single member or you can have a multiple member. And I don't like to say you have to do it a certain way because I don't know. If I have to wait till I talk to you and see okay. what your situation is, okay? So generally, here's what you can do. You set up a new LLC. Um, I just recommend not in California, but if you like California, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can make the owner an unincorporated association. Okay. All right, so what that means is that the banks will satisfy their uh, KYC and so forth without getting information about the unincorporated association. And the way that works is the, it's the undivided interest in a group. So what you've done is you've spread the ownership to a group that's not defined because the unincorporated association, there's no list of the owners. There's no list of the members because maybe it's your family, maybe it's your neighborhood, who knows? Nobody has an undivided interest, but guess what? You're the trustee, so you make all the rules, right? It's just a matter of you telling putting in the document and saying, okay, the owner of this is this unincorporated association and here's the name of it. And so that's the end of it. So then you don't, you don't have, the owner doesn't have any liability, taxes or creditor or anything like that because it's not a person liable, okay, only you are. But then your relationship to the company is the signer. You're not the owner anymore. So that's one way to do it. That's your single member LLC, okay? You can do it that way. A dual member, multiple member LLC, you can you can just about accomplish the same thing. The difference is that each owner, each member will have to uh, disclose his uh, identifying information. So if you don't mind doing that, you can pretty much have the same benefits with a multiple member LLC. With the single member, you could get away with a lot. It's just that when you run into like a collection situation, you're gonna have to add another member because if you have exclusive interest in something, it could be attached. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thanks for that, John. Um, Chris is our next question. Chris, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask John your question, please. Chris? Okay, yeah. Um, hi, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Uh, can you hear me, John? Yes. Okay. Hi, John. I'm, I'm calling you from Tampa, Florida. So it sounds okay. like you're in Florida as well. Yeah, I'm real close uh, by. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question's around, you talk a little bit about whether it's an LLC or another entity about uh, taking a loan from that entity. But what about uh, as far as getting the entity started, whether you're doing crypto investments and giving a personal loan to the entity? Because uh, it creates a li I mean, it keeps a liability between me and that company, which can be beneficial, correct? The loan is where you would borrow money from the company. Okay. The company is the lender. So let's say, let's say if I bought a house with my windfall, within a short period of time, I tell people within 30 days, I would have recorded a mortgage with the LLC as the lender, myself as the borrower. And then I would be the owner of the property. And likewise, if I took my windfall and paid off my existing mortgage, that would be taxable unless I recorded a new mortgage and I kept a good record about making payments. So that's another thing too. You want to make sure that it's a real loan. You can write whatever terms you want, but it still has to be documented that you've actually made payments. You're, you're making payments to your own company, by the way. So 
It's not a third party like a bank loan. Right. P. Is that an answer, Chris? Okay. P, go ahead. You're up. P. Let's go to Shamsa, perhaps. Okay, Shamsa. Um. Hi, hi. Hello, John. Hi, hi we just John. picked so last year. I'm fine, I'm fine. Now, John, um, you know what? You're, you're a genius, and I feel like it can work. The, the thing is, you know US laws, but HMRC in the UK are a very nasty, nasty beast. Very nasty. So, if, if I could, under, if I could um, have full confidence in the robustness of the setup for the UK, I can manage the how to, you know, like you say, you have to be careful how you manage your property, right? That's fine. Yeah. Through the things you mentioned, loans and um, what else was it? Um, anyway, I've made a note of it. That's what worries me because without going into detail, um, the partnerships, yeah, without going into too much detail, um, the HMRC have been extremely vindictive about partnerships and loans in, in kind of uh, certain scenarios. And I mean, really vindictive. They brought in a 20 year retrospective tax. I think I told you about this last yes, Tuesday. Right. Now, the only reason that is on, we're on the verge of winning that is there's an absolute genius ex HMRC inspector. And, um, he he's sick to death of the uh, uh, mm -hmm. the the way they did it, and uh, basically he's he's an absolute genius. He's had to leave the UK, but he's on the verge of getting the law changed. Right. But we had to really fight to get about two hundred on odd MPs made aware of all of this. Mm -hmm. You know what they were trying to do. So so I think the thing is, if I if I could understand exactly what the setup would be for the UK, what I would try and do is get this guy to kind of look it over and if he says it'll work then i know it'll work and that's no that's no judgment on you yourself it's just the sure. way and the way they're going we have to be really careful with the way it, it it'll operate in terms of loans taking out loans and partnerships believe mm. you me huh. i think probably about a hundred thousand people and there have been suicides on this as well um we've been wow. them, they're really nasty really unbelievable well from from what i've researched and what you've told me uh yeah. hmrc is terrifying they are. <laughs> i have to tell you and uh, but but there's a way to work it legally i mean i'm not trying to break any laws or, or or you know find any tricks but yeah they could they could create whatever they want i mean they're they don't want you to have any tax benefits even if you can get tax benefits so um yeah i think it it's just a matter of i mean i could sh i could share with you the details that'd be great um, we could do that. I mean, for example, we could we could register a company in the UK. We can even use um, what what you're really trying to do is just get access to a bank so you can move money in and out of the asset. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 what's going on. Is uh, and so. I think can, if I have the details, I can probably give it till the end of April because he's trying to. Um, that's okay. when the legal change will be made, and there'll be a line drawn under this. But HMRC, they seem to be able to just make up the law, and that, that's the way it is. Yeah, of that's course. What I have to say. It's they all make policy. Up the law. Yeah. But yeah. how do they? It, what, what does it matter about the twenty years? I mean, why wouldn't? You, why would you just not have property in your name? Like, I, I don't care if our no, government no, no, does it, that. It, no, it's not the twenty years. It's the fact that they snuck something past the MPs, who are all dopey anyway, right? Self, self-serving dopey. Uh -huh. So and so's right, <laughs> and they snuck it through like on a Friday evening with like yeah. five. MPs were half asleep and stupid to boot, right? And they got it through and it, it became law. So once it becomes law, so what I'm trying to say is they, they, they seem to just change the law at will. Right. That's the way it seems to us, right? Um, so I think if I could have an understanding of the structure, the proposed structure, mm. I will then try and get some of uh, this guy's time and run it past him. He is a genius. So okay. maybe... For everyone's help. for everyone's benefit on the call, and we can talk more, of course, by Skype or yeah. something. But for everyone's benefit, this in in the worst case scenario, what I like to do is make the owner that has all the liability. The owner has all the liability. Okay, 
I make it something that is not within the purview of the tax collector. Let's just say taxes. Okay. Let's talk about that. So what that means is Shamsa and I, we have nothing in common. We don't, we don't do business together. We never ran a company together. So she and I together would not have ever have any type of tax liability anywhere. Right now, if you and I together did a partnership somewhere and then we reported taxes and whatever, now we would have created a person that from then on would have a tax liability as long as it's doing that thing right together. Make sense we would have created the person with a tax liability where before we, we didn't have a tax liability together. I might have individually, you might have individually. So if I make the owner of a company in the UK or wherever, if I make that owner something that doesn't exist anywhere, but it's legal, then it doesn't have a tax liability as long as you operate it that way. And they'll even agree to that. There's no way they, what they, what they'll do though, is this is where I see what HMRC does is they will, try to identify your interest in the operation. And that's what you have to deal with. It's not hard. I just don't know exactly what to tell you on that other than what I've already told you. So we can revisit that. We can look at that again. And I also have some other ideas about there's other jurisdictions that you could be using and other ways of managing those assets um, and get outside of that system. They're actually pretty simple to do that. But basically, if you make the owner of the taxpayer to be something that's not a taxpayer that they can't tax because it doesn't really exist. For example, an unincorporated association, then you, you, you could legally avoid the tax. Okay. John, that sounds great guys. It's now 825 and we wanted to try to keep this um, webinar to 90 minutes. So we've got time for one more question. And then after that, John, if you could share again um, with everybody your contact details, how they can find you on Ace of Coins and Privacy Club, um, that would be great. So Michael, go ahead with your question for John. Michael? Michael? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? There you go. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I clicked it and it didn't, it didn't click off. Thanks for hosting tonight, guys. Um, John, just hopefully a quick question. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to determine if an LLC is, is going to work for me or not. Um, I've been in cryptos for a couple of years and my plan is to ride this next cycle up for, you know, however long, 2022, 23. Uh, with the hopes of getting into real estate. But in, in the short term, I'm just looking to take some gains when we have these cycle highs and then lows. And from the beginning of the video, it sounded like maybe there's three options. To cash out into fiat, which is obviously not going to be good for taxation. Uh, to roll over into a different crypto, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me either because if we're going to ride these cycle highs, if I'm cashing out, uh, for example, in Bitcoin, I'm not going to be buying Litecoin because they're both going to be on the upswing. Um, and then the third option it looks like is to uh, convert to a stable coin. Is that, is that really the only option then? If you want to take profits permanently, take them out of the, take them out of cryptos. Is, is that what you're talking about? Uh, eventually at the, at the, at the top of this nut next cycle to roll into real estate. But in the short term, I'm looking to okay. just. Okay. Well, the, I actually have an article on aceofcoins.com called taking short term crypto profits. So that might help answer a lot of your questions. So there's some okay. resources there that you want to consider using. Yeah. I do recommend some of the stable coins in that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I would just say um, you can probably spend a couple of hours going through the different blog entries that John has on his Ace of Coins website. There's um, an unlimited number. I mean, well, not unlimited, but there's a myriad of um, blogs that cover a lot of different subjects um, that John has covered tonight, but as well um, that maybe we haven't touched on tonight. Um, so um, that's going to do it for the questions and Marius, I'm going to throw it back to you and then you can throw it over to John and then we're um, going to say good night. Yeah, Bill, thank you very much for setting this up together and thank you, John, for spending your time here on a Sunday American time 
to bring this valid information to, to everybody. Guys, I want to reiterate, you don't want to get to the point where Bitcoin, where you make a million dollars and then run to John or somebody else to set up your, your process because you can't reactivate or go back in history and, and sort these issues out. They will, the tax man is smarter than that. We need to be one step ahead. Always think like a chess player. Think 9, 10, 11, 12 steps ahead of the game. We brought John on here to help you. We don't make any money out of this. You, do, you will deal directly with John. Uh, John will help you. There's a lot of free information. I'm surprised, John, by all the free information you've given people. But guys, use a person who is in cryptos, who understands the crypto world, to help you to protect your assets. You are going to see that there is going to be enormous growth in the cryptocurrency world. The American economy is not dead. Not at all. Don't buy into that narrative. You know, you're going to see that silver will go up, gold will go up, and cryptos will explode in price. It has to happen. There's no other thing that we see where it turns downwards and dies. When you make that money, you want to protect your profits. John, just the last word to you, and then over to you, Bill. We can close down, and I'll, re I'll put thank this you. recording up on our website. Well, thank you, Marius. I really appreciate the chance to uh, discuss this with your group. Absolutely, Bill. Uh, yeah, thank you, guys. And you can just close well, down, Bill, and... Perfect. Uh, Marius and John, thank you for giving us the opportunity to get together and spend some time asking questions and getting um, some more insights into how we can protect our current and future cryptos. Um, Marius, I just, you know, plug the site, Bitcoin Trend and Forecast. And for John, um, we've got Ace of Coins and Privacy Fight Club. And um, again, thanks very much. Thanks to everybody who joined us. And to Marius's point, Marius, you're going to post this on your website? We will, Bill, and we will also make this video available on YouTube. Uh, please go and re-watch it. Get in touch with us. We really want to help you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, perfect. Okay, guys, good night, and thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay, bye.